Hello, hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you please let us know where you guys tuning in from? Oh, I see some places there. Dubai, Toronto, Costa Rica. Hola. Uh, London. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, thank you so much for being here. So last time, I have to apologize on the last session. I was streaming from the dark net. <laughs> it was pretty terrible, my connection in Barcelona. But we're here, we're home, we're at the studio. And super excited today uh, to have a, a friend and a, and a close guest into this session. <laughs> Live from the clear net, yeah, exactly. Oh, Los Angeles, Italy, France, okay. It's getting pretty from all over the world now. So thank you so much for joining us today. So as you know, uh, we have these sessions every month and we want to inspire students, creators, and we also you know, help them to know all these other uh, people that we admire and we want you to introduce you to them and and remember that the chat is open. You can make some questions, and we can, you know, like uh, make some questions with the, with the, our guest. So our guest today is uh, Memo. Uh, are you there, Memo? Uh, okay, let's go live for Memo. Hey everyone. Hello, <clears throat> Hello my friend. How are you? I'm very good. It's great to see you. It's been a while. Yeah, we were just talking before, you know, last time we met. Well, last, well, when we met, it was almost 10 years ago, right? <laughs> Something like that, I yeah. Think, I, think. I think it was like the beginning of Twitter. So I remember exactly how we met. Like, you were looking for an extra ticket for the off festival. Oh. And, some, and then I say, yeah, I have one extra ticket. Or something like that, but I didn't know it was you. It was like you were just asking on Twitter, and wow. I was saying like, "Hey, I do have an extra ticket." That's that's how everything started, I think. <laughs> I don't remember those specificities, um, but I mean, you used to run a Vimeo channel, right? Um, yeah, I used to run a super, you know, like big, huge Vimeo channel with, you know. Uh, showcasing it still has a lot of people but i haven't posted anything in years <laughs> i mean being being featured on your channel was um was like a make or break thing back in the day this is like i guess 2006 2007 2005 when um like vimeo was really uh, like a, the place to be that it's where the community this is before there was no discord there yeah. was no twitter there was no instagram Vimeo was the place for like visual creatives working with moving images, whether it's abstract films um, or motion graphics. <laughs> Sorry. And yeah, I first knew of you through your Vimeo channel. And what, what was it called? The Experimental Motion Graphics Channel. That's Something, what it yeah. was called. And so yeah. if, if I got a notification... I think it still exists. <laughs> I'd get a notification like your video has been added to the blah, blah, blah channel. I'm like, wow, yes, this is incredible. Because um, that was, yeah, that was um, quite, long time quite a I thing, still, yeah. yeah, that's a funny story that, uh, you know, like I, uh, this is how probably I started meeting a lot of, uh, a lot of people because I was starting this kind of like, I came back from Barcelona to when I do, I was doing my studies there. And I came back to Mexico and I was really sad because there was nothing there for, for, for me into this industry. Mm -hmm. So I opened this channel where I can be able to have this window. So I was able to see, you know, other people's works that they were doing all over the world. Yeah. And, and I was, I was remember about the story about how you started and, you know, like I still, I still remember the specifics, I have to say, <laughs> but I want you, I would like you to share this, like, uh, like you're from Turkey and how, you know, this wonderful story about you being from Turkey ended up being, you know, like a digital artist now. So I'm really curious which story you remember, um, what, the, because I guess the, there's the military one. 
<laughs> oh, the military one. Oh, I don't know if I can talk about that one. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> okay. Publicly. <laughs> But uh, no, I mean, the, I guess in a nutshell, um, I started programming at the age of 10. Um, I was very fortunate that my parents, so yeah, I grew up in Turkey, as you pointed out. I was very fortunate that my parents uh, recognized the importance of computers. This is back in the 80s. And so they bought a computer when I was, you know, 10. And in those days, a computer when you switched it on, so we had a BBC, a BBC Micro, like an 8-bit computer. When you switched it on, you just had a prompt. Like there was no Windows, there was no mouse. You had to type stuff. So if you wanted to play a game, you had to load in a cassette and you had to type load, run, whatever. So I learned how to program um, from books from the library. So I learned how to program from the age of 10. And for me, that was like the continuation of Lego. As a kid, I was obsessed with Lego. And what I loved about Lego was that I could make things that I wanted to exist that didn't exist. Like, I want this kind of a toy. That kind of a toy doesn't exist, so I would make it out of Lego. Um, and so learning to program at the age of 10, that's what I started programming. I started making things that I wanted to exist that didn't exist. And these were like weird, they were actually procedural animations, really. Um, but then long jumping ahead. So this is what I did throughout my teens. I studied civil engineering uh, at university through no choice of my own. It was just the education system in Turkey. Uh, and then I finished university and I kind of didn't see much future for myself in Turkey at the time. This is now 96. And so <clears throat> I kind of fled the country. The military aspect, I won't go into too much, but uh, I kind of... Yeah, I can't go on record saying anything about that, but it's all good now. So I came to England and <clears throat> I just was did all kinds of odd jobs <laughs> um, until I kind of discovered this scene that, because for, for many, many years, I thought I was the only person in the world who was using code for creative expression. Uh, and I didn't even think of it as art. I just, I was just <clears throat> playing. And then I discovered through Vimeo, um, I discovered through Vimeo, the processing community, the Flash community. Um, and of course, in the early 2000s, the Flash community was, was really where it was at <clears throat> with regards to um, coding for creative expression. And I just started posting stuff on Vimeo. So I, I would always make stuff. But then one day, I, when I discovered the community on Vimeo, I started posting stuff to Vimeo. And the stuff I started posting started getting recognized. Um, you know, I'm indebted to yourself for featuring a lot of my work on your channel. Um, a lot of the early blogs, like Create Digital Motion, you know, CDM, Create Digital Motion, Create Digital Music, uh, and then later creativeapplications.net came. And so that's kind of how it grew. I was invited to exhibitions um, and being immersed in those kind of communities also helped me develop my thinking and you know the way I conceptually approach work. So I don't know how that aligns with the story that you remember because you seem to have a very good memory, but um, uh, yeah, this is one version of it. <laughs> so... It's been very, you know, the way you approach to technology, uh, from my perspective, it's been really playful. <clears throat> uh, it still is. Like, if I see your stories, you know, playing with technology, you play with TikTok or you play with, you know, as a, you know, as a truthly way of being a kid, but playing with that technology. And that's something that I admire so much about your approach. You know, like some approaches are very scientist, scientific and something, you know, very researcher. But your approach is like so much in the uh, not constrained, but also, you know, being a kid. And can you share us more about, you know, like how do you approach to play with technology? How do we approach with playing with AI and all of these kind of like technologies, like the way you do? So that's a very, <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Because that's a very, um, 
astute observation, which I really like um, the, the, you know, the, the kids like approach, because I would say, although where I might push back a little bit is, well, let me start by saying this, definitely everything I do stems from curiosity. <clears throat> like I, I'm just really, really curious. Uh, and everything I do does come from curiosity, um, which I liken to a childlike curiosity. Like I remember, you know, my some of my earliest conversations, uh, like with my dad asking, like, you know, what's at the end of the universe? You know, what what was there before time? And like these questions are the kind of questions that kids ask, and then. Most of us, as we grow older, we start seeing those questions as <laughs> like maybe stupid and not productive. Like, what kind of a stupid question is what's at the end of the what's at the end of the universe? And we we are encouraged to not ask those kind of questions. I think there's only two kinds of people who continue asking those kind of questions, and they're scientists who actually take these questions seriously, but also artists. And so, I do think that. And this childlike curiosity is common throughout artists, researchers, and scientists. In fact, um, <laughs> I remember um, I was at a conference once and I was going to give a talk. And I chose this quote um, from Carl Sagan, which says, we are all born scientists. And as we grow older, this curiosity is beaten out of us. Uh, the, the trick is to retain that childlike curiosity to remain a scientist. This is my words. I forget his exact wordings. But at the same conference, Golan Levin um, was also giving a presentation. And he had picked a quote by Picasso, which basically said the exact same thing. Um, but as artists, where Picasso says, again, I'm rephrasing, I don't remember his exact words. We're all born artists. Um, but as we grow older, we are, this curiosity is kind of, um, programs out of us so I think all kids have this right you know when you take your bottle of <clears throat> spaghetti and you pour it on your head you're, you're conducting an experiment like this is how we um, actually on a quite meta level I now <laughs> work a lot with AI um, and this is one of the big things that is now a big open question is like how do autonomous agents like humans or animals learn about the environment without giving them explicit goals. You know, it's through curiosity. We conduct experiments and we, we learn. Um, but for society to function, we need people who don't, who aren't curious, who just do the job that they're supposed to do. But I digress. Going back to your question, um, I've somehow managed to cling on to this curiosity <laughs> and everything I do comes from that. It's really the basis of my practice. I would consider myself a researcher above everything um, in the sense that like a lot of my work has been quite um, has been quite influential for like like forums for example something I did ten years ago it's it's become a genre at, at the time there really wasn't much work like forums uh, but now it's become a genre uh, but but for me I have no interest in recreating that because for me that was a, a research question of like exploring a particular aesthetic, a particular way of making movement-driven um, abstract animation. So now that that's done, I can move on to the next question. So I'm more, yeah, I'm interested in exploring uncharted territories, really. So now that you mentioned about uh, making things that uh, we're able for others to use, uh, I have to make... I want to, this is not a question, but this is more kind of like a thankful message for you uh, because uh, because of your work, I was able to build a company or to be part of a company uh, and people were working in that company and you know, like uh, there's a lot of like things that happened through all of this kind of stuff. And I do remember when you released this MSA, M MSA fluid, right? Mm. <laughs> this uh, super mega awesome <laughs> fluid, which, you know, like is still being used in, you know, uh, with people. And, 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 you know, like this is not a, like I said, this is not a question, but it's more like a thanks, thanks for your work 
it's been helping the community and it's been helping uh, you know business and people who are you know going to this thing you know getting very uh, thrive right in what they do you know even you know in terms of the AI uh, research and things that are happening now you know I've seen the things that are happening right now you researching this years you know so many years ago and for for the uh, for the people that are like the the, the mortals, you know, <laughs> uh, that's new. And this is something that you've been, you know, very truly to the AI, uh, uh, you know, beginnings. And I wanted to ask you a bit more about uh, AI, like uh, how, how how come? Because you know, I've seen your work, and you you've been there just right at the beginning when things started to became extremely interesting, but no one put attention on it. And you were there the whole time, you know, still there. And I want to ask you about, uh, you know, like, what was your intention? Like, how do you became so interested? And, and what did you discover? And, and what were those kind of like first feelings when you were like doing this kind of like playfulness with the, uh, with the technology? Um, that's a good question. But first, I want to touch back on the open source stuff. Because when I first moved to London, um, it, like after university, I was just doing anything to to pay the bills, and I discovered PHP um, and MySQL. So I started doing like in my that like free not not even free like yeah contract work building PHP MySQL websites, and that's how I discovered the open source community. That was my first introduction to open source communities um, in I guess the early two thousands, late nineties maybe. And I remember like asking on a forum, a PHP forum, like I, my code is crashed, like I, it's not working, this is the thing. And then some stranger, like I'm actually getting emotional just remembering, some stranger would reply and give me the correct code. I, I'm, I'm getting I'm really emotional thinking about this. And I remember thinking some stranger somewhere in the world has taken time out of their day to help me with my project. And like, I, I was like, wow, what is this? So I became very, very in indebted to like open source, like there and then. And then after, you know, PHP as my kind of artistic career started <laughs> um, taking off, I was very active, primarily in the open frameworks community. I mean, I also engage with processing <laughs> and I'm very indebted to the processing, processing community. Um, but because I come from a background when I when I started learning to program, I learned to C. Like that was my kind of first language. So I preferred open frameworks over processing simply because it was C++, <laughs> a language that I was more familiar with. And then again, like there's this huge community of people that are just releasing code open source so that any project that I make, really, even if it's a solo project that I make all by myself, a uh, quote, all um, all by myself <laughs> actually like maybe hundreds of people have contributed to that and some of them are even credited some of the <laughs> some of them aren't even credited so I, I felt so indebted to this um, that I would open source um, anything that I developed as well particularly libraries <laughs> so I would like the MSA fluid MSA physics GUIs <laughs> lots of things I would open source as a kind of um, thank you back to the to the community. <coughs> um, going to AI, your question about AI. Um, my interest has always been building. So we do. So let, let's start with the idea that there's code based arts, right? There's people who make art with code. Within that, there's a group of people who are maybe more interested in performative tools, um, tools which are interactive <laughs> and real time. And this doesn't necessarily have to be for actual live performance or like interactive to an audience, like an interactive installation. It could also be interactive just for me. Uh, like I would make films that I would put on Vimeo as a finished film, but I would have made it interactively. So I would build a system that's interactive and then I interact with it. Um, to control it. Like I, I even made music videos like this. I made a music video for Depeche Mode, um, a few others. So I'm interested in interactive systems. 
And as you dig deeper into that, ultimately, what is an interactive system? It's a system which is somehow reading information from this world, the world that I inhabit, and it's taking decisions to, to do certain things. And this interactivity can be very simple, like some of my really early work is this very optical flow based, you know, you wave your hand and there's a wave of particles. Um, but then I always wanted to build systems that are a bit more intelligent, a bit smarter. Um, in fact, Myron Kruger was writing about this in the 70s and 80s, like, and he called them responsive environments. These are environments which <laughs> observe the, the physical environment and then respond intelligently and augment the space. So he wrote the, about this you know, in the 70s and 80s. At the time, I wasn't even aware of Myron Kruger. I was independently discovering this. But so this is how I got into AI. Um, first, through computer vision and... I got into, I was interested in neural networks very early on, um, like in the 2000s. But at the time, because I was conceptually fascinated by this idea of, a, of an artificial neural network. But at the time, it was inconceivable that an, an artificial neural network could do anything remotely that I would be interested in for the kind of work that I wanted to do. Um, what the big aha moment for machine learning came for me when the Connect came out, Microsoft Connect in 2009, I think 2009, 2008, because the Connect could do skeletal tracking from uh, a depth image. And this is a problem that I had tried to solve for, for a project <laughs> and I had decided it was impossible. Um, and then the Microsoft Connect came out and then there were the Connect drivers and then the OpenNI drivers, if you remember. And the <laughs> OpenNI drivers, the skeleton tracking was not very good. The Connect, the official Microsoft drivers for skeletal tracking was shockingly good. And so I looked up, like, how do they do this? And they use something called random forests, which is a form of machine learning, not, not artificial neural network, but another form of machine learning. And that's when I realized, okay, Machine learning is now, so this is about 2008, 2009. Machine learning is now can do things that are useful for me. Um, and so I started keeping an eye on it. <laughs> and then deep learning started becoming big in 2012. 2012 was the big changeover for deep learning with AlexNet and image recognition. And so I said, okay, I need to really follow this closely. And then in 2014, I, I had a company, Marshmallow Laser Feast, which I had co-founded. <laughs> um, so in 2014, I decided to leave MLF and do a PhD in deep learning, which turned out to be an interesting thing because now it's one of, you know, it's obviously, it's, it's crazy what's happening around AI. So that's, I guess, a shortish version of how I got interested in AI. And... I have have this question that for me it, it's quite important because you know like uh, coming from uh, coming from you has a lot of like meaning uh, and I want to ask you about how do you see the relationship with uh, humanity in the short short and long future uh, with AI you know because you know if there is a person that can you know like see their vision they can share that vision a very, you know, like short and futuristic, I will assume is you. So <laughs> I want to ask you that for a long time. That's, um, that's a very complicated <laughs> answer, actually, because there's many levels to it. Um, there, one of the, <laughs> I'm simultaneously so excited and exhilarated, um, but also terrified. Um, what I'm, I'll start, what shall I start with? I'll start with what I'm terrified about. What I'm terrified about is really the context in which this technology is being deployed. So the, the culture that we live in, the economic system that we live in, the kind of exploitative, profit-seeking, um, extractivist culture that we find ourselves in, which is basically raping the planet till you know we, we are literally 
and causing an extinction. Um, we are knowingly destroying the home that we live in for the sake of bottom line to increase to, to increase profits. So developing AI by a handful of companies, like literally there's three or four companies who are owning AI right now, and maybe a few startups coming up in this environment is, is worrying. Like that's um, a very real part of the reality of AI. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and to be more concrete, what I'm referring to is that this is a technology that is going to potentially really <clears throat> increase the inequality gap. It's going to further um, establish a domination of certain individuals or companies, things like that. So on one hand, there's that. On the other hand, what really excites me um, is, again, I'm someone who's curious and I just love learning stuff and discovering new things. And I think AI is, the, you know, this single most influential technology with regards to learning new things. <laughs> and when I say AI, AI is a very, very broad term. Um, already, it's very problematic. I just want to clarify what I mean by AI. <laughs> because by AI, some people think of things like Blade Runner or, um, you know, like robots, I think of 2001. I'm not referring to that when I talk about AI. <clears throat> that is... Today, we colloquially call that AGI, um, but AI, what I'm referring to by AI is the, is the technologies that we have today. Really, I want to talk about um, deep learning, or I want to generalize a bit because deep learning is a bit maybe too specific, <laughs> but software that is able to learn from data. Like that's what machine learning is quite, quite formally. So it's software that's able to learn from, from data and deep learning a very loose definition we can say is software that is able to learn from very complex, high dimensional, big data. And this is the flavor of AI that's really dominating our lives right now. And I do believe that if, if humanity is going to eradicate cancer and leukemia and Alzheimer's, it's going to happen with the help of AI. Uh, notice I'm not saying that AI is going to solve it. I'm not saying that there's going to be C3PO robots who's going to solve it. But these are tools that we're going to be we're going to use to learn new things about ourselves, about the universe. Um, that aspect of it, I'm really fascinated by. And even like LLMs, like with ChatGPT, when you have a conversation with ChatGPT, your like metaphors fail. Everyone's trying to come up with metaphors, like it's a blurry JPEG or it's a, it's a stochastic parrot, it's this, that, the other. I believe we're at a point where these metaphors fail. Uh, it's like calling a car a horseless carriage. Like this is not a blurry JPEG. It's not a stochastic parrot. It's, it is what it is. It's an artificial neural network. It's a transformer that's been trained on gazillions of words and it has some kind of knowledge and I think this is huge because the paradigm shift that's happening is we have all this knowledge on the internet, but what AI is doing is it's organizing that information and providing an interactive interface to it. So it's a kind of way of searching that um, knowledge, but also synthesizing new knowledge. It's still very in its infancy, like you know, ChatGPT synthesizes a lot of garbage, but nevertheless, when I have a conversation with ChatGPT, sometimes it feels like I'm having a conversation with our elders, you know, with like with Newton, with Einstein, uh, with with all these great thinkers. And if you project that into the future, um, <clears throat> I think on one hand, AI can really help propel us really, really far. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, we have the extractivist profit-seeking capitalist culture that we're in. And so that clash is going to be really interesting and is ultimately going to determine where we end up. 
And one of the things that are, that, are, that is part of our responsibility is how to use these tools with certain responsibility. And I think that's where, you know, the type of job that we do, you know, by creating artistic approaches, by using this technology in a very creative way, this is part of our, I, I will say like as creators, this is one part of our most interesting responsibilities that we have now. Uh, because you know, like there will be more technologies that are going to start, uh, you know, rising. You know, the more we progress, the more we advance, right? Uh, but I, but I, but it's been really interesting about how we have been able to use art to use it as an expression and to you know overcome. And even this industry where we are, like the immersive industry, uh, I don't know you. You remember when we were in Oeiras in Portugal ten years ago, sitting. In, in the conference, watching all these speakers, you know, that was just people doing experimentation and doing, you know, like very uh, artistic work. And that's why we were there, you know, like in this kind of like stuff. And and I think uh, art is going, to, I'm, not, I'm not saying that art's going to save us, but I think it harps a really good hope. I, I can call it that way. You know, uh, a hope that it's going to, uh, guide guide us through and overcome through all of those kind of things, you know, the way we express. And and I really like the approaches that you do with AI and art. And uh, I don't know if you want to share with us a little bit more about your design process uh, of your artwork, you know, like how, how, how this is becoming more and more present. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, what you just, I just want to... Um, reiterate what you just said about you know 10 years ago when we were at off and it, there were experiments i mean definitely you know in those days you know going back again to the early days of your channel 15 years ago or so everything was very experimental it wasn't like it wasn't a thing like immersive media in immersive interactive media it, it wasn't an existing thing i mean obviously people like maron kruger was experimenting with it in the 70s and 80s and so many other artists were exploring it, um, but it was still so experimental, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that again, there's a lot of, it was very research driven. It wasn't a, you, you couldn't take a solution off the shelf to apply to a problem. It was, it was all very um, research, <clears throat> experimental, <laughs> and I would say curiosity driven. And this is I'm going to link to the answer to your question now is, again, everything I do comes from a place of curiosity and research. Uh, the PhD that I ended up doing around AI was specifically around real time, continuous, meaningful human control over generative deep models, um, which means, um, you know, my interest, again, was you train an AI model on a ton of data. And then, especially in those days, like you would just say generate and it would just generate something like the training data. And I was interested in, well, how can I, as an artist, as a human, control this? How can I steer it? And there's very interesting things here, like what does it mean to control? Um, what level of control uh, is, can, can we talk about? <laughs> and my interest was, always steering or directing. I was thinking, okay, we have this thing, this software that we call AI, <laughs> that we call AI, that is capable of producing, you know, incredible texts or image or music. Uh, but I enjoy creating as well. I don't like, to me, there's no satisfaction in having this thing create thing independent from me. I want to collaborate with it. I want to co-create. I want to steer it. I want it to inspire me. I want to inspire it. I'm using very heavy words here, which I'm sure some people are thinking I'm um, going to accuse me of anthropomorphizing, but I'll just park that criticism for now. We can get back to it maybe. But so this is my research is how do I meaningfully control these systems? Um, and one big inspiration for me from the very beginning, even before AI, you know, going back 20 years is music and musical instruments. I love playing musical instruments. Um, I love that feedback loop of sitting at a piano or playing a guitar and you take an action and you hear something and then you respond to it. And there's this immediate feedback loop. 
Um, and I kind of liken this to, you know, to get quite systematic to like a cybernetics closed loop with feedback. Um, you know, it's one thing to just sit and write music. It's another thing to play a musical instrument and have that real time feedback loop. <laughs> it's the same thing when you're in a band and you're feeding off each other. And that allows you to reach places that you wouldn't otherwise be able to reach. And this is the relationship that I've always wanted with the computational visual systems that I've been building. So that's why I'm interested in interactivity. That's why I was interested in, in AI, because I wanted to build a system that could respond to me intelligently in a way that it could inspire me. Um, and this has been my interest in AI. Having said, so that's one approach, and that's what I ended up doing my PhD in. Having said that, I've always been very interested <laughs> in um, understanding the world and understanding us as humans. And a big part of that is our relationship with technology and how technology and science um, and faith and religion um, and ethics and law, how these are all interrelated. So my design process is I'm always thinking along a few different levels. One is playing with the technology to understand the technology because I feel like I really want to understand the specifics of how various technologies work. Then I'm also thinking about how, like what drives certain phenomena. Um, like for example, with AI, I'm really fascinated by religion in general. Um, religion as this, such a strong force that has been in every kind of human culture in all kinds of shapes and sizes across millennia, um, religions, mythologies, um, rituals, like these are integral parts of humanity. Uh, like you could have a human, you could have humans without arms and legs or eyes or ears, but you wouldn't have humans without mythologies and stories and, and religions and faiths and deities. Um, <clears throat> And the evolution of that, like the societies and cultures that have evolved. And <laughs> I like situating AI within that discourse, um, like going back 10,000 years. So I think about all these things <laughs> and I do experiments. And then the way I visualize this is each one of these ideas are lots of seeds that like things grow out of like vines or something. And then sometimes these touch, like I might have one seed here about a topic. I might have a seed here about a particular technology. Um, and then lots of vines growing out and then sometimes they connect. And when they connect, there's this bond. And then I say, okay, I've got a project now. And then I just iterate on that and I develop that to be a project. God, this talk is becoming, uh, it's amazing, you know, like... <laughs> Bringing uh, religion and faith and mythology into it always kind of <laughs> blows the lid off um, potential conversations, yeah. I want to make a, a small pause here to, you know, like to talk a little bit more about uh, the HQ uh, and, uh, and then we can continue. So um, uh, Memo didn't know he was going to talk for the HQ. <laughs> Uh, and it was fun because you know, like, uh, oh my god, I didn't know it was for the HQ. I was like, yeah, it's for the HQ. And he was like, oh, I'm a big fan of the HQ. <laughs> I've been following their tutorials and everything there. So um, I want just to let you know that uh, the, the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro is the, the school for immersive designers, creative technologies, and touch center artists and developers. Uh, there are over 60 full touch center and creative technology video courses there. It's like 170 hours of content there. Uh, we have some uh, accelerated sessions, some specific sessions for uh, people who want to, uh, you know, learn about some other specific uh, ways to make uh, immersive experiences. And this month, we have a 50% off the first month uh, for the HQ Pro until May 30. Okay, going back to this, you know, uh, small promo. Um, we're almost, you know, like, times fly and we're almost 
at the end of our session. Man, I can't believe it was that was fast. Uh, but I just want to say so. Uh, if people have some questions, uh, they can throw it in the chat, and we can go through all of those questions. Uh, and uh, I would just want to talk about your decision about leaving uh, the company that you uh, co-founded, right? Uh, actually, uh, we were we were sharing a similar situation because I left the my, the company that I co-founded as well. And I I just wanted to ask you about your your motivations about living in you know, like a successful coming uh, a successful company, and also you know like what will be the advice that you will give to uh, you know young de uh, developers, creators, students that are just starting in the industry. Right, because you know, imagine that uh, in that time when we were at off 10, 10, 13 years ago, both of us sitting and watching the conference, someone will give you that advice. Uh, what would that be? You know, like, yeah, advice that's um, that's an interesting one. Um, there's so much. Well, let me put it this way advice, there's so much advice I would give the younger me <laughs> one one of them actually is not my own advice it's advice that i heard from jonathan harris um, a good friend and a, an artist who i admire a lot and i don't remember his exact wording so i'm going to word it in my own words but the sentiments was something that he had said which was people don't know what's in your head uh they will judge you for what you put out into the world. And this is in the context of many people, uh, especially when they're young, are kind of always waiting for a break. And like, oh, if only I could be given this break, I could show what I'm capable of. Uh, but you know, unless you have amazing connections, uh, you're not going to get given a break unless you have something to show. So, so make stuff make things that you think are representative of you. Um, just find a way of making something that you can show. Uh, obviously, it's not going to be representative. You know, you might not have enough budget. You might not have enough time. You might not have enough resources. Um, but try to make things that communicate who you are, what you're interested in. Uh, because if your portfolio shows this while you want to make this, no one's going to come and give you space and money to make this when this is what your portfolio shows. So find a way of creating a prototype for this. <laughs> That's one thing that I heard Jonathan Harris say, which really resonated with me because for many years, <clears throat> I wasn't putting anything out that was representative of what I wanted to do. <clears throat> That's one. Another one I would say is, could be controversial. <laughs> I, I don't know which way to go with this, but try to, understand early on who you are, what you like, what you're good at, and what you're not good at. I definitely wasted a lot of time trying to do, or maybe waste is a, uh, not the best word. I definitely spent a lot of time trying to do things that I wasn't very good at, um, when in fact, I would have been better off not even trying to do that focusing on what I am good at and collaborating with people who are good at the things that I wasn't good at. Um, so this is a tricky thing because some people might say, find what you're not good at and then get good at it. But in my experience, find what you're good at and what you enjoy and focus on that and then fill in your gaps with, with other people. You know, that's what I would say. Um, networks are really important. Friendships, like I, I love having grown old with people, you know, with people, not that I'm calling you old, <laughs> but, you know, people that I knew 15 years ago um, when, you know, we were kids and we've all grown into different places and different around, <laughs> places around the world. And those relationships are really important as well. So definitely nurture friendships and relationships. Um, <laughs> I mean, advice, uh, God, there's so much I could say. I've always tried to... <laughs> tread a line which is not very trodden i've always tried to be tread the untrodden line um you know effort to stay more unique 
um, you know, it's it's easier to be unique in an area where there's not many people. <laughs> so uh, that's one thing. You know, look what other people are doing. Understand the whole landscape of things, and then try to explore directions that are perhaps less less explored. Um, if somebody's done something in the past, study the past, study what people have done, and then ask how can I build on this, not how can I replicate it. Definitely replicate things. Replicating is how you will master your craft. Um, so definitely take all the things you like and recreate them. It's the greatest way to learn because you have a clear goal and that's how you can master the craft. But then also ask, how do I make this mine? Um, that's very valuable as well, I think. I'm going to add something else for what you've been saying, because that's, you know, from the same philosophy that I've been following, it resonated in my head and, and it's very closely. And, and I'm going to add something for the people who are just starting like a studio or wants to have a studio in this industry. I would say like, do not have uh, work for clients. Also make personal artistic projects for the studio. Because, mm -hmm. you know, like people are going to look for you, not specifically for your client work, for, but because of your, you know, artistic creative work where you have no clients. And that's something that is going to propel you, you know, very, uh, very soon and very powerful. Because, you know, do, you do a lot of research. You do a lot of kind of like, uh, you know, kids exploration, I'm going to call yeah. it. Right? But that's something that, that I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that could be added to that. So I'm going to read this wonderful uh uh, comment is here from Roy. No questions. Just I want to say this has been super inspiring talk. Memo's work was one of the biggest reasons we got into this field. And it's amazing to see he keeps years ahead. Truly inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, very touching to hear because, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I would go to conferences and oh, I would see works and I was inspired you know, by people like Golan Levin and Scott Sneavy and, and Myron Kruger and um, Robert Hodgin, uh, what I first saw at um, Flight 404 at uh, Reasons, what was it called? Flash on the Beach. Flash uh, on the Beach. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, actually, Off used to be called Offline Flash Film Festival. <laughs> yeah, back, back when Flash was, <laughs> I mean, yeah. also also off like you know go to off you know in those years um it, it was great great communities seeing yeah. all that work yeah man we're we're almost done in this session uh thank you so much uh for everything for the inspiration for your work for uh your enormous contribution and for also uh always being a kid you know always being this playful kid that is sharing it has its so. downsides but uh, i hope i hope <laughs> everyone can cling on to their yeah curiosity and um and, and enjoy life through and that you know lens. what I, I, i'm gonna put it like this so i think it's it's like having a truly jedi mind on this so i've seen you do this research on tiktok and then you're putting all this kind of like uh, researching about tiktoks about what people are doing about filters and that kind of stuff and you know, for me, it's like, oh, I, I want to do that research too. And then I go to TikTok and then I've got really kind of like, you know, like a slave into TikTok. Like, shit, I, and I've been download, downloading and deleting people at, at TikTok like five times. So I, I'm not, I'm not into TikTok anymore. I just uh, uploaded it's that. dangerous. <laughs> Actually, my TikTok has now just become kids playing guitar. Um, I'm <laughs> loving it. It's Is such it? a crazy algorithm. It's, it's so quickly changes. I, mean, I have about five TikTok accounts because they keep getting subsumed by a particular thing. Like on one account, I might like a video of some kid playing Metallica. I'm like, oh, cool. It's 12 year old kids playing Metallica. I like it. And then all I get for the next month is all these kids playing Metallica. And I'm like, I'm here for it. Um, <laughs> So yeah. But anyway, thank you, thank you so much again, uh, and thank you guys for you know joining the session. You know we have a super powerful session here with people from all over the world. Uh, keep doing this uh, work, keep experimenting, keep being a child, uh, and also you know like uh, keep doing shit, right? <laughs>
Thank you so much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. It's been amazing to see you again, kind of in person. This is the first we've been in person. I really hope to see you now that I'm on this side of the Atlantic. You know, I'm in California now. I really hope to see you in person um, soon. And thank you to everyone out there on the internet who has tuned in. Um, so I'm going to reveal something only for this channel. Uh, you know, off Mexico City, it's it's coming this year, and Memo's going to be there. So I'm just don't tell anyone yet because this hasn't been released, but he's going to be in Mexico City uh, at off. So see you at off in Mexico City. I really look forward to it. It's been a while since I've been to Mexico City, and it's been a while since I've spoken at off. So um, <laughs> I'm very excited. All right, guys. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll see you next month. Cheers. Thanks so much. Bye.